Welcome to the latest episode of Sports Bazaar with me, Mick Malloy, and doing the heavy lifting as always, it's Titus O'Reilly. How are you, Titus? I'm very well. All right, now, uh, you've, you've, what have we got? Is, uh, where are we going? <laughs> where, Give me a sport. <laughs> this is going to be a fun one. Might be multiple episodes because there's Here so much. I would just, how do you not know how many episodes it's going to be? Because I'm an idiot. <laughs> but you see, so you haven't meticulously mapped this out. We're just no, gonna, you know me, never meticulous. Yeah. No, I've mapped it out, but it it could, I, it'll be two, maybe three, depending. Two, on. maybe three, be, because what's can, our biggest? FIFA. FIFA's our big. FIFA. Oh, what America's FIFA? Cup. America's Cup's our longest because we oh, had seven. Because yeah. we had, you know, but seven. FIFA was six, but you just know FIFA. They'll it's be back. Still right. They're not it's done. Still writing itself. <laughs> that book it's, is open. It's not even close. Oh, As we, yeah. well, I think we talked on a bonus episode, which our members would uh, know. We um, talked about how they elected a delegate who's lit- the other week, a like, few months ago, who's literally in jail. <laughs> So it hasn't oh, changed. The, the Olympics don't deliver. They did under Juan. Didn't Juan. They? Juan Antonio Samaranch, who was like a, the Olympic set bladder. Yeah. Well, He's, he was, he ran a loose ship. Yeah, that well, was, Haviland, uh, remember, who was set bladder's mentor, oh, then, was on the IOC board as well and was close with Samaranch. So I reckon we might do Samaranch. Um, we've got the Paris Olympics the Paris coming, Olympics coming up. up. So we'll I think we're going to have some Olympic... Fun and games coming up later this year. Sure. All right. But Stand by. Today's all about hijinks, which you love. Oh, I love this. And we are going uh, back to uh, the 80s, basically, late 70s into the 80s. Mm. And we're going to Wimbledon, not tennis, soccer. Football, Wimbledon. The okay. crazy gang, they were called, and Vinnie Jones being their most famous member. Well, I know Vinnie Jones, of course, who's segued beautifully into acting. He's kind of a, a Guy Ritchie go-to. Yeah. Always plays a hard nut. Yep, absolutely. Um, and uh, he was pretty hard on the field, right? Very hard. And But the thing is, often people who... A lot of people listening might not know this story, and you're in for a wild ride. Mm. For those, I have to say, I'm not up yeah. to speed with this. Well, a lot of people know Vinnie Jones, but Vinnie Jones didn't create the crazy gang. He's a product of the crazy gang. <laughs> oh, is he? The alumni. He's more like he comes in later, but we're in for a wild ride. So let's let's the get crazy started. gang. I'm, I don't know much. As I'm feeling a bit of a Hanson Brothers vibe here. <laughs> yeah, am I? if you're called the crazy gang. <laughs> It's not going to be, oh, these guys are really chill, laid back, no. easy going guys. If you're in the crazy gang, there's going to be an onus at some stage to be Absol- crazy. Absolutely. And they they get it for a reason. All right. So, in Wimbledon, uh, Wimbledon FC was the club. And it's based in, obviously, southwest London. People know Wimbledon from the tournament. Yeah. They were formed in 1889. And they moved to their stadium, which was called Plough Lane, in 1912. And they were an amateur team for a long time. So up to 1964-65 season, they were purely amateur. Yes. So this is not one of the, you know, it's not a Liverpool or no. a Chelsea or a Man U. It is a purely amateur. Yes. No one's getting paid. They're not competing with anyone at Are they in level. any division or is this, they're, they're not They're even... in a couple of low-level amateur leagues. Yeah. So they're not in the football leagues, you know, which yeah. for those aren't into soccer, you and I have talked about this before, you also got the Premier League at the very top. Yeah. Then you got the Championship, Championship. Division, uh, League One, League Two, League yeah. Three. And then if you fall out of the football leagues because they have promotion relegation, you go into s- semi professional yeah. level. And that's where Wrexham have been. The yeah. big story of Welcome to Wrexham sure. and people across that story was about getting out of semi, the, yeah. the semi amateur into the football league. So, yeah. so. In 1964-65, they become semi-professional Wimbledon and they enter what was called the Southern League. They are not in the football leagues. They are not a professional right. side. Um, they won the FA Amateur Cup in 1963. This is their biggest moment in their history yep. up until this point. Um, now, when we get into the 70s, they start to get known as... A bit better than a for a semi amateur team, they're punching well above their weight. Right. So they beat Burnley in the 1974 75 season in the FA Cup. It's the first non league team to beat a top flight club team. in history. Yeah, right. So they start to people start to say, Oh, this team might be good enough to be in yeah. the football leagues. Um, they then win the Southern League in 1975, 76, and again in 1977. And, and people are saying, 
this team is too good yeah. to be down in semi-professional. Um, and people are saying they need to move up to the fourth division, which is the, the beginning of the football league. How do you make that transition? Well, now it's an instant promotion based on results. So, you know, Wrexham won their league, which then promoted them into the football league. So you can still be relegated out of the league and altogether. And now you still can be let relegated out of professional For, if you finish. In, into, yeah. They've changed it. It, sad, it used to be Division 4, Division 3, Division 2, Division 1, and Division 1 was the top. It was the top That's tier. been That's renamed into pr- Premiership, the Premier League now, but this is back in the day before that. Oh. So to enter into the league in those days, though, it wasn't automatic. So they've won three years in a row their league. And today they would just go straight up. But back then you had to be voted in. To, right. So someone had to come out. So it had to be a board meeting and the Football League would vote someone out of the league. Based around performance. Them being terrible, who's the bad first, crowds, yeah. all that sort of stuff. So that would be a factor in the vote. Oh, absolutely. Like You had to be seen to be able to not only be a match on the field, but be... Have enough infrastructure have, yeah, to and all host that. teams. Yeah, you're, uh, you're coming up to bring professional. No longer are you semi professional. It's like an audition. Yeah. So the chairman at the time was a guy, he was the owner as well. He was a guy called Ron Nodes. And he'd purchased them for uh, in 1976 for £2,800. So this is, unders. this is well before. Because you know now it's like you've got to be an oil sheik or a Russian oligarch. <laughs> That's right. You need to be an oligarch yeah. to own a- now, Back then it could be, you know, you could be a reasonably well off. You could own a car, few car dealerships and you could probably buy a football team, especially at yeah. the lower end like this, right? Yeah, gotcha. He starts a campaign to get them in. It's a PR campaign, but he's also hitting up the football league saying, we should be in. Can you get us in? Um, there he put together this special brochure saying that it's sent to the football league, showing all their facilities and their yeah. crowds and everything and why they should be in. And one of the things he did is he, the photo said um, he said here's a picture of an evening game, and underneath he wrote an evening game at Plough Lane showing the quality of the floodlights. Right now he said later on the floodlights were crap, so I wrote it in a way that. When he said showing the quality of the floodlights, yes. it could be read as Interpreted the quality is, you like. <laughs> the yes. quality is terrible. What was the intonation? Yeah, but he said so. <laughs> I was just lying, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. They're a total like held together with sticky tape club at this point. So one of the defenders, Dave Donaldson, he had signed for fourteen pounds a week. He had a well-paid job as a senior systems executive at British Airways. Yes. So they had organised with British Airways that his timetable of when he had to work would fit with the fixture. So they were just doing anything <laughs> to get guys to be able to play. You so know? This is like, resourceful stuff. It was yeah. resourceful, but it was also... To give you an idea how broke they were, mm. like had no money. I mean, one, they can be bought for under three grand, but <laughs> one time they're trying to board a, a bus or to an away game and the coach driver locks the door and they won't let them in. And then bang on the door, the plays. He says, you can't get in. I haven't received any of my money for my previous... <laughs> trips driving you guys around. Now, where have we heard this before? This was Jimmy White. Jimmy White. <laughs> Jimmy White. So That's it's very one of my similar. Favorite stories. So they call down Ron, the chairman and owner, and say, he won't let us on. So he used to write a check out there and then for all the back stuff. <laughs> so they under the door. Yeah. Shh. Doors open. <laughs> Shh. Shut. Um, uh, another time when they did have a bus, they went to Swansea to play an away game and they stopped at a service station to fill up the bus and they accidentally left behind a player, Dave Galvin. And they just drove off without him, <laughs> and he and he didn't play the game. He didn't. He just, oh, wow. So they're like they're total amateur hour, right? At this point, um, they used to steal traffic cones from the nearby freeway for their training. <laughs> Mate, this is terrible. <laughs> so Rondo wow. is desperate to get in the football league. He spends three grand, which is more than he he paid for the, the club. Paid for the club. On a Dons for the, they were called the Wimbledon were called the Dons, Dons for Division Four PR campaign he paid. One stunt involved getting Tony Gregg, who is currently yes. the England cricket captain, to be a director. So a bit like they did with uh, Yuri Geller <laughs> <laughs> and Michael Jackson in our, that episode. Tony we did. Gregg, that's a good call. Though. It's a good call. It's going to draw a fair bit of attention, and exactly. I mean he's probably the most high-profile sportsman 
in the in country. England, it's England captain of, of yeah. the test team. So, so they're doing. They're, so Noakes is smart. Get the lion on the line. <laughs> Remember, he did those ads for Kerry no, Packer, and he did the um, the pitch reports, of course, in Australia oh, for oh, years. Pitch reports. He'd stick a he'd stick a key, key into in a the pitch cracks. And he'd yeah. Just... <laughs> Bring back that was great stuff. Yeah, it was. And first player to wear a helmet. Right. Yeah, he was. So it was World Series cricket. World Series. He came out with basically a motorcycle helmet, well, like he'd like he'd ridden a Vespa to the ground. Yeah, yeah. And then just walked on and because because well, we got to do World Series cricket at some sure. point. But they had the drop in pitches for the first time. Yeah, they and did. And they were so hard that the ball would just bounce way more than it ever had before and faster. And so it broke Hooks's jaw. Yes. And and so that's why the helmet got invented because of the World Series cricket and the drop in pitches. But I always like the. Thing, the story that the box to pre- pre- you know protect your wedding tackle yes. was invented in the 19th century yes. and it took till the 1970s <laughs> to men to think of putting on a helmet we got the essentials covered <laughs> i can wear one in the noggin exactly but i'm not well there you go so in not right, Tony Gregg. So that's so, a good call, I reckon. Yeah. Is, that, is that in the budget in the three grand? Yeah, they bring him on. That blow the whole thing. Or? And well, I think he was also a fan of the club, so he was from. Yeah. So that well, he wasn't from there, but he was. So they they had all these. You know, they're doing everything to say we're winning on the pitch. We've won yeah. three years in a row, and we've got Tony Gregg now. And yeah. Here are our floodlights of a certain quality, and <laughs> meanwhile they they can't afford buses, all right? Right. So at the annual general meeting of the Football League on the 17th of June, 1977, which was at the Café Royale in London, mm. it was announced Wimbledon would take the place of Workington in the fourth division. They got 27 votes compared to Workington's 21. How is that announced? Well, how's the meeting? Is it like electing a pope? Like yeah, what the, all the, they, all the key, conclave? Well, yeah, all the key people who run the Football League get together and, and various clubs have votes and they're all chairmen's of other clubs and stuff and they all vote. And you, can you lobby at that actual meeting or have you done the, all the hard work before I think they're they... Doing, they I think they present at the meeting too, but they've done a lot of the hmm. lobbying and glad handling and you know bringing Tony Gregg to lunches and... They're doing so everything. they're not all sitting there like they're about to award the Olympics to a country or something like that. It's, a, no... it's not. It's a bit like that. In that there's a vote, so it is more like a pope enclave. Yes. I don't know if they, you know, a bit of smoke goes. <laughs> a bit of smoke is released. They should bring that in the so sport. Wouldn't that be great? Oh, it'd be great. It'd be fantastic. Like a gender reveal. <laughs> they, they, they just the colour of the smoke yeah. is the oh, it's Wimbledon green. Uh, so Wimbledon <laughs> are, are suddenly in. Um, now, Alan Batsford had been the manager. He falls out with nodes six months after this vote, and he got replaced by a guy called Dario Grady as the manager, right? Mm. At the same time they've become professional, they're getting ready to play in Division 4. They've done it. They're going to become fully professional. And they've had a guy at the club for a couple of years who is their um, first... He's an apprentice, and he gets signed as their first ever full-time proper professional. Right. His name is Wally Downs. Wally becomes the founder of the Crazy Gang. The whole, he's the spiritual, you know, kind of guru of it. Everything about what's to follow begins with Wally. And he's their first... He's their first professional. professional He he comes, um, he's the spiritual leader, right? He becomes, um, he's signed by women and is a 16-year-old. Um, he was paying for West London boys. And even as a 16-year-old, they know he's not yet a full professional at this point. At 18, yeah. he becomes a full professional. There's a few years before they're in the top, yeah. top the Division 4. He was known to have no fear with other play, older players. Right. This was when there was initiations, players, like, you you know, younger players had to clean the older players' boots, all right, stuff right. that doesn't Grommet. happen anymore, yeah. right? And it was very much like, you know, you had to impress it. it. From earliest days, he was someone who showed no fear whatsoever yeah. and also was known for his pranks and just general mucking around, <laughs> right? Um, he ended up playing 207 games for Wimbledon between 1979 and 1988. So he goes on to be a great player, breaks his ankles quite a few times, so misses a lot of games. Right. But is the key guy there for a long part of this run. Um, they used to get these long train journeys to places like Rochdale and Halifax, and there was no exclusivity. in that There was no players' carriage or anything. All the fans who went with the team to the away game mm. would come back with them, right? Yes. So they are all in the same carriage. And 
Wally love this, right? They would drain the buffet car dry. They would drink all the beer and <laughs> spirits and wine every time on yeah. the way back. They just okay. no holding back. They'd have a sing along, whether they'd won or lot. Then they'd continue on. Uh, they'd get the coach from the train station and drink on that. Then they'd arrive at either the Sportsman Pub, which the club owned, or there was a nightclub in the stands <laughs> at the ground, at the ground <laughs> called Nelson's. And they would all get hammered there. Right. So huge drinking culture, right? One time after a reserve team game, Wally's on the bus and the bus stops for fish and chips. Mm. And as the bus takes off and they're all driving, um, everyone's finished their fish and chips. Wally gets the box of chips and puts it on the driver's bald head. <laughs> right? <laughs> Wally said, there were still odd chips and bits of batter in the box, so his head started to burn. <laughs> <laughs> um, we're hurtling down the motorway at 70 miles an hour and he's forced to make an emergency stop. He then orders everyone out, leaving us stranded on the hard soldier, and then he quits, and so they'd have to walk home. Did they drive off? Did he, he drove, drove off? off, yeah. He just left, left the whole, team, left on the whole the team on the side of the road, right? A bit of time to think about. Wally loves this stuff. Another time, and everyone suspects it was Wally, there was a radio news report that they saw someone a player naked on top of the minibus while the minibus was driving around town. <laughs> right? Yes. Um, they'd do all this hazing and making fun. It was like you either sunk or swim. You, you arrived yeah. at the club, they would mock you mercilessly. Yeah. If you could take it, you yeah, were right. one of them. Yeah. If you didn't, you were out. So Defender Dean Thomas arrives. He's got a moustache and a side parting. So Wally nicknames him Adolf Hitler. <laughs> <laughs> and he just, just a goes, playful <laughs> nickname. He becomes known as Adolf Look Hitler. Out. He comes rest. Adolf Hitler. Yeah. <laughs> so they just think this is great fun. Right. Uh, another young player, Alan Cork, joined the squad. <laughs> Sorry, this is funny. Yeah, oh, I know. And yeah. this is. Did he change his hairstyle at all? No, he, he think he, about. He, apparently, he Wally, liked it. Wally said they used to call him Adolf Hitler, and he'd say, "Why? Where's the resemblance?" <laughs> And they're going, you got a moustache and a comb over, mate. Like, it's, you look exactly like it. And he's going, I don't see it. I don't see it. Uh, and the more he's you're like... wearing the, jodhpurs. The more he's like, yeah, you keep, you keep <laughs> goose-stepping everywhere. And the more he did that, the more he denied it, the more they just loved it, right? Oh, that's like, it. You've taken the bait. Yeah, you've taken the bait, right? They've got you. Um, now, another young works. player called Alan Cork joins, and he had an Austin Allegro, which you know, an old car, you right. know, and it kept breaking down. Right. And he tells Wally this. He goes, oh, God, this car keeps breaking down. I want a new one. Like, this is ridiculous. So Wally goes, oh, I reckon I know how to fix this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So they drive it somewhere remote. <laughs> <laughs> Wally's up to no good. And Wally says, we'll set it on fire and you'll get the insurance. And then you buy a new car. So they try and set it on fire. <laughs> Doesn't work. They go back, set it on fire. They're trying for like you know an hour to try and yeah. get this car to light. And they lie. Some they like try and put a bit of like paper in and light yeah, the paper sure. into the petrol. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. like the hole for the petrol. And they go, and they run away as they light it. And then it does nothing happen. So they keep going back and relighting it. Yes. And, and while he says one time they light it, it doesn't. They go back. It 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 doesn't light. They go, Jesus. So they all start walking towards the car. And as they're about to reach the car, the car explodes. <laughs> It's just not thought through. <laughs> wow. So they just knock about guys who just never think. There's no thought to consequences in, sure. any, in anything they do. Um, one night they get put up at a nice hotel just by chance on the on went before a game, and Wally starts filling bins with water and flooding the rooms of his teammates under the door. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> wow. Um. Other other players start to this this stuff starts to spread like cause Wally starts all these things. Mm. Others so they later f on that night flood Wally's room oh, of course and then would. he goes and complains to the manager <laughs> <laughs> and they have this meeting where they're going well, why'd you flood Wally's room and they go because he flooded all of ours and the manager's like oh fair enough. Everyone go to your rooms. Yeah. So it was like um, an, another player, uh, Glenn Hodges, who joins. He's a really good defender for them. One day, he's so furious with the ref, he spends the dying moments of the game trying to knock the ref out. But every time the ball goes to him, he tries to kick it at the ref. 
<laughs> this ends up in kicking off a massive brawl. Yeah. So they're all loving it. A guy called Derek French joins the club as the physio. Yeah. You gotta remember they got no money. Sure. The reason they knew him is he was a cab local cab driver that they often <laughs> used. Yeah. And they said, Do you want to become our physio? Now this guy wasn't trained as a physio. No. Um, and that would have been a late night discussion, yeah, I'm guessing, yeah, on the I way home was, from a Let's get Derek, we like him. So they get Derek. He'd been in this cab driver and he said, Making the transition from being a bad cab driver to a bad physio for me was easy because I was bad at everything. <laughs> So he Love joins it. and they do a pre-season tour of Finland, right? And during it, they're on a boat crossing over <laughs> somewhere and Wally grabs French and pu um, puts him over the edge of the boat, holding onto his angles to see how long he can hold his head underwater. <laughs> <laughs> another, yes. time, um, another time, another uh, time, another player called Roy Davies is having a drink with Wally on the train back from a game. Sure. And Wally says, do you want to, after we get off the train, do you want to get off and go and get, have a big night out? And Davies goes, I can't, I've got to get home to the wife. Yeah. And Wally goes, okay, I reckon I've got a plan. <laughs> so they would, the plan was that they would say Davies had been hit. They're going to burn his car and get <laughs> yeah. off. I don't know. <laughs> What's the plan? Their plan was they would say Davies had been hit by a can thrown by a Halifax fan <laughs> and was concussed. So they get the physio, Derek French, to bandage his head up. <laughs> they go to London. They go into a pub. He keeps the bandages on all night. They yes. get absolutely written off. At two o'clock, they get a cab back to Davies' house. And they in the cab and throughout the night they've gone through the story numerous times right which was you got hit by a can you got concussed you slept on the train we got back to the ground our home ground you had a couple of beers and we just checked you all right and that's why you're late home, yeah right and they drilled him like stick 40 to the times, story right? so they walk into the the house at two in the morning and the wife comes down and says where the f have you been and the whole story just goes out the window. <laughs> Davies panics and starts telling her the whole story. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wally came up with this idea. And Wally said the worst about it is the whole time he's telling her, he's unwrapping the bandage. <laughs> and the and it, and it the bandage just is, keeps unraveling for like what feels like an hour because it's just so long. And the guy's just complete. Wally's furious. Like he's going, this He's left Wally high. Yeah, drive. Wally's going, this story is. You don't abandon ship. Yeah. You stick to the story. Yeah, Wally's like, now I'm. So then Wally goes home and Davy's wife has rung her, <laughs> his, his girlfriend at the time. And she, um, when he gets back, he goes, I got it in the absolute neck from the missus. She blamed me for leading him astray. And then Wally said, these were fun days, happy days. <laughs> Fantastic. So down, Wally is just like he's. But he wore the bandage all night. Yeah, it was. But, and then, then he just folded. The folded. You're in character straight You're, away. That would have been easy to pull off. Yeah, it yeah, could have been. Are you okay? Oh my oh, god! No, Thanks for bringing him home, guys. Woozy. Yeah, I'm a bit woozy. If, if anything that yeah. says doesn't make sense, yeah, I better lie on the couch. Yeah, can you, you know, get me a beer? You could. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you could even like you know, if there's holes in the story, you go. I can't really remember. I can't what remember. Happened after You've got the absolute out. Yeah, Wally's I'm sorry, it's all a bit hazy to me to be honest. Honest. Yeah, Wally's come up with a great story. Oh, he's, well, Wally's come up with a masterpiece. Me. <laughs> In a fact, you and I might be trying, Matt. I hope, oh, I hope right. our partners don't listen to I'm this. I'm writing this down. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> so Down says it was just a great culture, but it did make them, everyone mentally tough. He said I, it was very, very tough love, he said. Um you know, only the strong survived. In Correct. This so in the 77-78 season, they're first in the fourth division. They finished 13th. Which was a good start because some yeah, people are yeah, expecting that's, that's them -table, right? to drop, right? Yeah, so it's like not bad, and they're they're, they're happy with that. Um, their manager uh, Dario Grady, he's identified that they got no money. They would get more coin coming in, surely. With yeah, stepping still up, not but... because they attract pl 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 uh, Plough Road. The stadium is awful, mm. and it only fits ten thousand tops, and they're pulling like two thousand a game. 
So they're getting, and this is before all the money came in through TV rights. And yeah. So the, your gate was a big part of it. Sure. And they were a small club. Like, they weren't bringing in much money even with going right. up to Division 4, right? Like, it wasn't much better for them. Mm. Um, so he sets up basically what's a youth academy. And this is before youth academies uh, were a thing. Were a thing. And this is going to help them out immensely down the track, right? The next season, they finish second in the fourth division. They miss out on the top just on goal difference. And this means they're promoted to Division 3. Wow. So they're suddenly now moving up, right? The 980 season, they have a bit of it. They don't do well at Division 3. They win just 10 games. They finish last and they go back down to Division 4. Mm. Um, so they, the next season, they start to improve, improve again. They're too good for Division 4, so they go back yeah. up to Division 3. Off the field, it's a mess, though, because Ron Nodes, the owner, he starts getting in talks to move the club out of Wimbledon to Milton Keynes, which is, you know, it's a bit like Canberra. It was after the war, after the, named after the economist Milton Keynes. Yeah. It was set up as a as a city from scratch. Yes. So designed from scratch. It's a bit of, it's seen as a bit of a plastic city in a way but they don't have a club and he wants to move them there this doesn't work this falls over the fans find out they're furious and anything so he sells up and he purchases crystal palace which is nearby and the first thing he does is he pinches dario grady the manager and takes him with him so suddenly wimbledon they are back up he's robbed the jury on the way yeah he's robbed it his last act as owner is to appoint the assistant manager dave bassett to the position of manager. Mm. This proves it to be the moment that basically changes everything. Okay. Right? Bassett, who's called... His name's David Bassett, but everyone calls him Harry. <laughs> I, don't, I couldn't find out why. <laughs> I don't he, know. So Harry Bassett. Yeah. He had been... He um, came in and everyone called... His name was David Bassett. Everyone called him Harry to the point where some players would come to the club who were potentially being recruited and they'd sit down and he'd say, Hi, I'm Harry. And so they'd sit down and chat to this bloke the whole time waiting for David to arrive. <laughs> um, yes. he, he joined Wimbledon in 1974 as a player. Um, he'd had a long career as a semi-pro, so never a great player. Yeah. He was a tough midfielder. Dirty would be how his a opponent good way to would probably it. describe him. But while he wasn't a great player, he was fanatical about winning. Yeah, right? sure. He was really driven. And he eventually get the game gets past him so he that's how he becomes the assistant manager he runs the reserve team and then suddenly he's the manager and he brings to this team this fanatical work ethic right so he just um starts bringing in all these new innovations so suddenly he gets their fitness up there's these long runs all the time through forests here we go it's like really full-on like training i'm hearing right? the chariots of fire music yeah, or the yeah, rocky yeah. theme yeah. Or he's there's, like there's, this is the montage yeah and this is when most football clubs just played five on five at training yes. and that was it he was making them run and run and run and yeah run, okay. right? um he also got a stats man uh neil lanham who would sit in the stands for every game and record everything kicks corners long throws but also the movement of the ball yes. and in the build-up to goals and stuff like that this was kind of unheard of so he was suddenly he was doing money ball before well, before well before there was Moneyball, you know, he was doing yep. this thing of using the data to find secrets and ways of improving that other clubs weren't even What's doing. Working, yeah. um, he also got there was a new owner who we'll get to. He convinced him to spend eleven thousand pounds, which is a lot of money at the that's time. Big coin. That's that's the biggest figure I've heard bandied around today. Yeah, and this is in the early eighties on video equipment, so they okay. could record all their games. And they would get tapes of other teams, even from Europe, and they would study them. And they would study opponents. And they were doing this well before anyone else was really doing it. Okay. So behind all of that, before that, Wally had explained that this is how they used to record games. He said, this is Wally's quote, we had a fat goalkeeper who was called the Flying Pig. <laughs> <laughs> he was in the reserves and his dad was a sergeant at Wimbledon Police Station so he used to use the police's CCTV <laughs> cameras to film matches and training hilarious so Bassett brings all this professionalism on the field but the other thing he decides is to create a strong team culture 
he decides the best way to do this is create complete chaos. So he sees Wally as key to everything. As he's, he's an agent, a chaos agent. Okay, he loves hijinks and mucking around and pranks. So on the one hand, he's, he's, he's data-driven and he... he and, and chronicles Vinny, everything yeah. and he's meticulous and fit and training is elite and then on the other hand he's encouraging a bit of madness he's con- like he thinks he's, genius. he's like he's like the more they bond and the more they do all this stuff to each other the, the more they become okay. a team but they also become tougher mentally and all this sort of stuff yeah. so he loves it right so um practice matches were concluded with a game of uh, a game called harry ball um, which was a player had to dribble through several grids with the ball, and the rules were that there were no rules. <laughs> like the players could do anything to each other. Oh, One game ended with a senior player with two broken ribs. <laughs> the flying right. pig involved. Yeah, they used to play <laughs> British bulldogs. Oh my god! After training, uh, that'll so, that's that's the end of it. That's the end of it. Um, so he loved all of this. Now, at one point, they signed a new player. And French the physio is walking with Bassett and they're all having a big night out. And they see the new recruit uh, fall into the bushes because he's so pissed. (laughs) And French turns to Bassett and said, he's one of us. He's got what it takes. He's got the right stuff. Yeah. So they're all into like boozing together, hijinks, (laughs) all this. You know, so that's the sort of thing. Um, for instance, once Bassett had decided to attend a post-match press conference completely naked <laughs> and sat behind the desk. He's the coach. He's the coach. He's the manager. Oh. And all the players go, we don't even know why he did it. He just did it to make us all... Was it was after all. a win or a loss. It was after a win. He just turns up naked. <laughs> right? Fantastic. Um, yeah, he'd get angry and scream at players. Once Glenn Hodges, the defender, was sent off in a reserve match. And Bassett wanted to call him the C word and was yelling so much he called him a fat petulant cake. <laughs> Miss Spoken called him a fat petulant cake. So his nickname becomes the cake. I was going to say, that's, that's got to stick. <laughs> so he becomes the, the cake. cake. Okay. Um, <laughs> one time, another time, they stopped the minibus again for fish and chips. <laughs> And Wally and another Wally gets off, and so does another player, Stephen Parsons. And Bassett then immediately, while they're in ordering the fish and chips, orders the bus to drive off, leaving them stranded in East London. Fantastic. Right. The next morning, Wally and Steve Parsons are first in at training, and they storm into Bassett, and they go, "What the hell?" Yeah. yeah. And he go, and Bassett goes, "It's got nothing to do with me, mate. All the young players like Glenn Hodges." Paul Fishton, Kevin Gage, Mark Morris, they made the driver move on. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> and so he hears uh, Wally and Steve. Uh, he says, the next thing I hear was squeals from the dressing room as both Wally and Steve took revenge. I loved it. It was bonding Bassett style. <laughs> so he's just like totally messing with them. That's right? unbelievable. Um, if it was your birthday at the club mm. and you were training, you'd get jumped on and stripped naked. And left to make your way back across six fields of, of oh, dog walkers. Happy birthday. Yeah, so they'd take you for a run, they'd jump on you, <laughs> strip you, and then you'd have to walk across these six fields. That's sweet. The locals were so used to it, they'd look at the naked man walking across and go, oh, look, it must be his birthday. Happy birthday. <laughs> Everyone just starts. Yes. Right. Um, so he often wouldn't order them to do pranks against each other, but he would, he would tacitly, like, no one ever got punished. Yeah. Right. If someone went to him and said the guys like did this to me, You're not he'd get go, you, "Oh, that." He'd go, oh, "Okay." Well, how are we going to deal with that? He'd go, "Okay." Sounds yeah. like you know you need to. Um, now, he also didn't mind if they did pranks to him though. Mm. So there was um, uh, there was one uh, uh, time he wouldn't allow his players out the night before a final game, even though the league had wrapped up was the last game that didn't mean anything. Yes. They said, come on, Gaffer, can we go out for the night? He said, no. And he knew they'd retaliate, yeah, right? Yeah. So the next morning he goes in and he finds his shoes are filled with deep heat. Right? This is before the game. And he's like, laughs and yeah. throw, put, doesn't put the shoes on, right? And he's like, you got to get up early in the morning yeah, to yeah. And catch me. So he gets into his track suit and his train top and everything. And he goes out onto the touchline, the game starts. And 15 minutes into the game, 
He feels a slight tingling <laughs> sensation around his <laughs> nether regions. <laughs> And then it becomes more and more intense <laughs> and it's getting hotter and hotter and he's hopping around and itching and the players are all laughing while the game's on. And he's, he says, he's, my knackers were of fire. <laughs> right? It, it's so juvenile. It, it, really. it turns out the players had got up early. They put the boots out as a decoy knowing he'd be suspecting something and knowing Genius. he'd find it. And then they got his jock strap and covered that with deep heat. Fantastic. Another occasion, the players are staying at a hotel and they got Bassett's bed while he was out and threw it in the swimming pool. <laughs> um, now, the funny thing about this is why they were all horrible to each other in many ways yes. and doing all this stuff. There was a, a goalkeeper joins. He was a young guy. And his name was Dave Bessant. And he went on to a great career, both at Wimbledon and elsewhere. He right? yes. becomes one of the great goalkeepers. But he's recruiting as a young kid and it's his debut. And he's inducted in all this stuff, right? Like right. the nakedness, the DP, all this. They always were like, they'd hide sure. your keys. If yeah. you left your keys somewhere, they were gone. Yeah, like, so he's had all this initiation. And he thinks, these guys are psychotic. I hate it here, right? <laughs> he makes his debut. They're winning 1-0 against Blackpool. And he lets in the easiest shots. It was so lightly hit. It went between his legs. Doesn't even roll to the right. back of the net. And he's like, it's one, one all and they draw. And they would have won. And he's like, these guys are okay. going to kill me. My professional career is over because yeah. it's his first <laughs> professional game. And they all, he goes back to the locker room expecting them to all give it to him. No one says anything. And then they say, come to the pub. And he goes, okay. And he goes to the pub and they all gather around him and go, we think you're great. We think you're going to be great. That was just to stuff up today. Forget about it. We are going to get you so paralytic now and just have a big night out. And that's what they did. <laughs> Fantastic. And so it was like, so it worked in a way, yeah. right? It was like, they weren't just like going out of their way to be horrible. It was the like... The underlying sentiment of that is fantastic. Yeah. So the guy that's bought the club after um, Nodes is a guy called Sam Hammond. And Sam Hammond is... Um, he, he bought it and he'd grown up in Beirut in Lebanon. Right. This is in the 50s and 60s mainly, when it wasn't the war-torn yeah. place it was now. It's doing quite well. He'd graduated from the American University of Beirut with a degree in civil engineering and he'd gone in the construction trade. And at the time, from the 60s through the 70s, Beirut, when he starts working as an engineer, there's a building boom, right? Yes. It's really going off. So the opportunities are huge. And he's smart enough to go straight into contracting. He's got a business. Yes. He's doing all that sort of stuff. And there's these huge projects being built. In um, Abu Dhabi, in the United Arab Emirates, he works on a major airport. And he's doing that. That makes him millions of dollars. So suddenly he's got money. Yeah. He's then doing other building projects across, like, you know, all the oil money's there. He's making yeah. money hand over fist. Um, in one of them, he's um, working for, uh, he's doing an engineer on a palace for an Arab prince. And there's the wrong kind of, they need sand, but the, it's in the middle of the desert, but it's the wrong kind of sand. Yeah, gotcha. So he's, he gets paid to just ship all the sand in. And um, he said, I made a lot of money from that one, I can tell you. So people start saying, this is a guy who sold sand <laughs> to, the, <laughs> to the desert. To the desert, right? Yeah, he was like to the desert right? dwellers. Yeah. So he becomes known as an incredibly canny businessman, right? Yeah. Um, in 1975, though, he's got a one kid, another on the way, and in Beirut in April of 75, a full-scale civil war breaks out yeah. between the Christians and the Muslim factions. The Israelis invade. Um, there's a war going on there for the next 16 years. It devastates yeah. Lebanon. Um, for him and his young family, he's got to decide what to do. He's got this huge company, but he's like, is it worth it? So he decides, I'm going to take cash out of all my businesses yes. and I'm going to move to London. And he picks Wimbledon because he likes tennis. Right, <laughs> yes. Um, he then starts, he turns his eye to this football club and he's read about it and stuff. And on a, almost a whim, he decides to become a shareholder, not the major shareholder yep. at first. And they put him on the board because he's a shareholder. And the, this gives you an idea when he joins how poor they are. The Supporters magazine write um, about him. And since his appointment to the board in early January, he has become increasingly popular with everyone. Two visits to the Supporters Club shop resulted in an extravagant spending spree, which went well into three figures. 
<laughs> Three figures. Wow. There's so, a whale in the house. Yeah. So th- this is yeah. like what it's like, right? Um, finally, he buys the... When when uh, Noakes decides to go by Crystal Palace, yeah. he decides, all right, well, I'll buy, the, I'll buy it all, right? Now, you'd think he's the owner and the chairman. He's the steadying hand because he's got Wally and he's got Bassett. <laughs> Don't tell me he's, you know. a, he's a prankster too. So on train trips back from away games, he once started throwing things around the carriage and ended up with all the players involved in a fight. He ended up on the floor wrestling with all the players. So he's as nuts as they are. He's a great And club. just loves it, right? Mm. Um, he also did odd things in contracts. He insisted uh, on a clause in, a play, in players' contracts. Every player that joined the club, now he owned it. If they lost by more than four goals, or if they lost by four goals, um, they would have to sit through a five-hour German opera. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow, that's playing hardball. That is. So they, they once they'll they get to, the best out. So here. once they had to all do it, the whole team had to go sit through a five-hour. Which these guys, who let's be honest, they've got attention deficit. Yeah, that's problems. Right. Yeah. Them sitting if through. They're not five, dacking someone in a paddock. Yeah, it's like. Yeah. Five hours of a German opera. Yeah. Jeez. He later inserted a clause that the players would have to eat if they lost by four goals uh, sheep's testicles, which was a delicacy <laughs> that he was always foistering on people, right? So that was another one he had. He was trying to sign a player called Robbie Earl, and Robbie, he said to Robbie, come over to my house and we'll chat. And Robbie Earl's not sure. So um, Hammond lo- lo- uh, locks him in the dining room and refuses to let him out until he'd signed. <laughs> And he says, if you sign, I'll give you the key. But if you turn down the offer, then they're hidden in my underpants, so you'll have to come and find them. <laughs> Go for a rummage. <laughs> um, so he ends up signing. So he joins. So it's the right? players, the coach, and, and the, the owner, owner right. are all yep. nutbags. And he's happy as owner even to be at the end of things, right? So the players used to get stick, stuck into him and do pranks on him all the time. And he loved it. He loved being one yeah. of the boys. They would often rip up his suits and cut them up with scissors if he took them off and was in something else. They would often throw them in puddle. They'd throw him and his yeah. suits. If he's okay, turn up in a nice You're suit, they'd, throw, the him them, a they'd throw him in a puddle. And he'd laugh. There's pictures of all this, right? It's hilarious. Um, he would creep into his own team's dressing room before the games, before they'd arrived, and scrawl outrageous insults about them on the walls <laughs> to motivate them. And one time another team found these yeah. um, before the game mm. and got all angry because they didn't know who had written them and everything. And about, like, the, about, about the... what he'd written on all the things. Because some young kids saw them and they were apparently quite fruity. <laughs> and he, he just... He said, no one was ever... He goes, I didn't write them. And then one of the guys goes, you borrowed my pen. <laughs> <laughs> so it was all like, you know... Um, he would also th- often throw their plane kits in the freezing cold bath before the game, so they'd have to wear them freezing cold just to fire. See, that's them not going to help your game. I'm all for pranking. I know, but I go, I'm not going to play at my best if I'm freezing to death. And the exactly, they don't know where to draw the line. These guys. Exactly. I mean, it's funny. Don't get me wrong. Yeah, You'd be yeah. sitting in the stand watching your team shiver. Yeah. You'd get a laugh. Yeah. And then they're going to lose by four goals. Then they're going to have to watch a German <laughs> opera. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> it wasn't all it wasn't not every psychological trick work. He's got it. game this one. This yeah. So you've got the owner, a manager, and you've got Wally Downs as the ringleader of all of this, yes, right? Here so we go. you've got this set up culture of mayhem. The nine eighty two season, they get relegated back to division four. They they're just not good enough mm-hmm. for division three. They're yo yoing back and forth. Um and it really leads them to try and have a big think about everything they're doing on the pitch. Yes. They don't think at all about, about what they're doing the off the pitch, let me be very clear. They're happy with that. They're happy with that. Uh, but they're like, are our tactics right? What are we doing? We yeah. need to change. And we might wrap it up there because when okay. we come back, they're going to carry out one of the most extraordinary runs in the history of English football. Of all time. Wow. All right. I cannot wait. You've salted the mind for me. That is amazing. I, I'm, I'm enjoying this story. I love this club. And uh, I really hope it pays off. I'd like to think that a hijinks prank-driven philosophy has 
<laughs> Dividends. All right, Titus, I'll rejoin you for the conclusion of this story shortly.